Uh, so I returned in July from three months in Mexico with Maria Isabel Morales. Uh, we took a class from Evergreen called Alternatives and Resistance to Global Capitalism to two states in southern Mexico, Oaxaca and Chiapas. During our 10-week program, we met and worked with many non-government groups and social movements and individuals, including those involved in popular education, defense of communities and communal land against mining companies, protection of water and environment against the privatization of land, and against violent repression. We met with teachers and students involved in supporting public education and supporting indigenous languages and popular educators. We also visited autonomous communities such as Alemania in Oaxaca and two Zapatista communities, La Realidad and Morelli in Chiapas. Oaxaca and Chiapas are the two poorest states in Mexico and the two states with the highest proportion of indigenous, what people call the original people in Mexico, probably around 50% of the population, although official estimates are lower. Much of our study and interactions were with indigenous communities and their struggles against poverty, for relevant and quality education, and for self-government. I stayed in Mexico three weeks after the class ended in mid-June to cover the July 1st elections, which were elections for over 3,000 positions, including all of their Senate and deputies, like a House of Representatives, the President, Mayor of Mexico City, eight governorships, and many, many local officials. I will discuss what happened in the elections and the significance in the second part of my talk. My talk is also based of studying Mexico for over 40 years, including spending over two years there, including six months in Oaxaca. Let me start, uh, so this is a map of, of Mexico. I'm not sure how well you can see it. We were basically in Oaxaca and Chiapas. As I said, the two southernmost states, two of the three poorest states in Mexico, and the two states with the highest indigenous population, but also two states with maybe the most amount of resistance uh, in Mexico, especially in rural areas. By way of kind of context, Mexico today is in the midst of an economic, social, political, environmental, and cultural crisis. The elections of July 1st, which I'll get to later, is a step forward, but unlikely to address fundamental problems in Mexico. So very briefly, the context of people who haven't uh, spent much time in Mexico or know much about it. So the Revolutionary Institutionalized Party of the PRI, they ruled Mexico from 1929 to 2000, often just a one-party state. And they came back to the presidency under Enrique Peña Nieto from 2012 to 2018. He's still the president until December 1st. Until 1982, basically from the 30s through the 80s, Mexico had what you might call national capitalist development. They limited imports. There was a big focus on developing industries such as steel and auto. There was public ownership of telephones, elect electricity. Oil was nationalized uh, in 1938. And there was some limited support for uh, agriculture and the rural areas in the countryside. There was a growth of income for the urban population, which is rapidly growing. And there was also a combination always of co-option of movements, like offering people in various movements positions in the government or giving them some kind of goodies, but also major repression. A very famous one was uh, 50 years ago, October 2nd, 68, when over 300 students were killed in Tlatelolco in Mexico City, basically for their support of political prisoners and uh, working with social movements around the country, just before the 68 Olympics there. So Mexico, in this period, let's say, of national development, it wasn't as brutal as Central America, but many, many disappearances of activists in the 1960s and 70s. Since 1982, when the Mexican government said they could not pay the interest on their growing national debt, uh, they made an agreement, which I call neoliberal development, which marks Mexico from 82 to the present, selling off public industries like telephone, which were the source of wealth of Carlos Slim, one of the richest people uh, in the world. 
welcoming without restrictions foreign investment like Walmart, welcoming f foreign banks who control Mexico today, uh, welcoming mining companies, and also unlimited imports with no restrictions of corn and other goods, reducing spending for public education, making it easier for firms to fire people and have people work part-time, the so-called labor reform, very anti-union, trying to break, for example, the teachers' union, lowering the real minimum wage, ending subsidies for peasants, uh, and also subsidies for basic food such as tortilla, milk. This was institutionalized by NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement in 1984. And it's, which, the, the neoliberalism has been going on for 10 years, but continued. For example, more recently, uh, Part of the whole Mexican pact of money had been that energy is public, but uh, in the last few years under Peña Nieto, they've opened up and allowed drilling by foreign companies in Mexico. Income and wealth inequality has grown, as has an ideology of individual advancement rather than collective and community development. The top 1% in Mexico owns over 50% of the wealth. Mexico today is totally integrated into a global capitalist economy, large flows of money into the country, but it's also a fear today of that money leaving the country causing a major depression. Okay, uh, the economic crisis, okay. The ec Mexico officially, poverty is almost one half of the population there. Uh, about two thirds in rural areas, and over 70% of the population is officially poor in Oaxaca and Chiapas. Although there is a small official unemployment, over half of employment and growing is the informal sector, those not working uh, for jobs covered by Social Security, such as selling goods on the street. The minimum wage, which far more workers get than here, is only 88 pesos a day, less than $5 a day, and falling when you consider inflation. Maybe the equivalent of $12 a day, if you uh, correct the price being cheaper there, Real wages, what people make after inflation, have been stagnant or fallen for the last 10 years. There's very low economic growth. There's also a slow decline of the currency because of capital flight and high inflation making import goods even cheaper. The peso today is about uh, 19 pesos to dollars, which makes imports more expensive. Income distribution is one of the most unequal in the world, far more unequal even than the United States. So that's briefly economic. Brief, next, briefly, the social, economic, and cultural crisis. So I think these are very important to understand what's going on today. Uh, in 2006, uh, the new president, Felipe Calderon, began what he called the drug war, mobilization of the military against the uh, narco gangs. Since then, according to official numbers, over 30,000 people have been disappeared almost definitely dead, over 200,000 murders connected to the drug wars. Uh, the projected uh, murders this year are projected you know, at the current rates to be over 30,000, five times higher than the rate of the United States. And the, the official rates really hide a lot of the actual murders, although still lower than Guatemala, Honduras, and Salvador. Much is tied to violence among gangs, but much, many court in crossfire, also kidnappings, extortion, high killing of women. I'll show uh, some slides in a few minutes of a demonstration against what they call, what's called feminicide. Fear is quite high in both urban and rural areas, although not in all parts of the country. So insecurity is one part of the kind of crisis going on. A second is corruption. Again, by these various studies by the UN of Corruption, Mexico is one of the most corrupt countries in the world. Uh, bribes for jobs, incredible corruption with the police, very few crimes reported because of that for government contracts. Very famous Odebrecht, a major Brazilian company, very involved in bribing uh, Mexico for major contracts. And this contributes to a lot of the cynicism. Probably corruption was the main issue in the election. Thirdly, in terms of the crisis, the social, environmental, uh, cultural crisis, migration from rural areas, especially people over 14 years old. Uh, the lower price of corn has contributed. People cannot survive in the countryside. Climate refugees as the land becomes less and less sustainable in many areas. Lack of schools and health service. So we have migration uh, 
both to urban areas in Mexico and to the U.S. and Canada. Part of, fourthly, in terms of this crisis, influence, I think the influence negative both U.S. and neoliberal culture, consumerism, individualism has grown, U.S. standards of beauty, declining indigenous languages being spoken, even though there's still 30 indigenous languages in Oaxaca and Chiapas. A, continue, a continuation of, of racism in Mexico, uh, indigenous language not, violate, not valued, often people call them dialects and people feel often ashamed to speak indigenous languages. Okay, politically, uh, the, I said the PRI has been the dominant party uh, since the Mexican Revolution. There's been a huge support of, of the PRI. I'm not sure if they can be covered now. Peña Nieto, who was the president from 2012 to 2018, running on a reform platform, uh, ended up as business as usual. In most of the polls I saw, he was the second least unpopular, uh, second most unpopular president in the Americas. Only high, about 10% in most of the polls, only higher than Temer in Brazil. Uh, the police, government, and not seen as solutions. Less than 10% of crimes are reported, and it's less than 10% convictions when people are arrested. Of course, to all of this, there's resistance, and I hope to have a few minutes to talk about it. Growth of feminist and LGBT movements against mining, about keeping alive the case of the 43 students from Ayotzinapa Guerrero who disappeared almost four years ago, September 2014. But also, again, for many, many visits, there's a strong feeling of hopelessness, focus on private lives and individual survival. My next section is on migration. Let me just say a few words and go on to talk about some of the movements there. Okay, so in terms of uh, migration, Mexico has had this amazing change, one of the most rapid in the world. In 1950, it was 75% rural and 25% urban. Today, uh, 67 years later, it's 80% urban and 20% rural. So you've had a huge migration from the countryside to both urban areas and the United States. Neoliberalism has been a major contributor. Uh, and also in terms of the United States, you know, growing violence is also a factor, though probably less than uh, Central America. There are almost 40 million people of Mexican uh, descent in the United States today. Uh, much money is sent back to Mexican families. Uh, in 2017, it's called remittances, money sent by Mexicans working in the U.S. to Mexico. $30 billion was sent back to Mexico, about the same amount as money that came to Mexico from tourism and oil. Uh, so for most Mexicans who migrate, distinction between immigrant and refugee is artificial, as most people are both. Uh, as people know, it's an incredible militarization of the U.S. border with Mexico, uh, one of the factors of that, uh, or results of that, is that you don't have people going back and forth in the same way that they did before. Uh, again, just this is a kind of a slide aside, but I think relevant, and I mentioned this to people earlier today. When I think about the border and policy, because I think that's a really exciting movement in the United States, the whole immigrant justice movement, to me there's really no justification of the border. I was mentioning at dinner to a friend of Antonio's who uh, is sitting over there and is very involved in this meeting tonight, a friend of both of ours, uh, Carlos Morentes, his parents live less than a mile from the border uh, with waters. They live in El Paso. So the question is, why should your life be different because you live in El Paso rather than Juarez, right? It's basically the same person. And to me, there's no justification, any kind of moral grounds in saying your life should be different because you're born in one place than another, which to me is, you know, a very simple way, uh, justification. Just mentioning briefly, which I think is not known as much here, there's also huge migration through, uh, through Central, of Central Americans into Mexico and through it. And one uh, program that we studied some while we were there is called the Merit, Merit Initiative of Plan Mexico, a plan 
Frontera Sur, which has been the huge growth of Mexican troops on the border with Guatemala, also U.S. Special Forces being there. And for example, Mexico deported last year, 2017, three times more Central Americans than the United States. And there's you know, huge repression of Central Americans in Mexico. Uh, rapes, extortion, assaults by the military, police, gangs, some community members. There's also a lot of solidarity uh, in Mexico. So I think you see both the repression, but also solidarity of the people. Uh, for example, in the early 1980s, uh, the bishop in uh, Chiapas, Samuel Ruiz, a really impressive person, went into uh, Guatemala during the the horrendous war against leftists and indigenous people and led many people into Chiapas and got people, even though very poor, to open their homes to people from Guatemala, often also of Mayan origin. So, uh, and while we're there, there was a caravan, which is talked about by uh, criminal President Trump as these hordes coming to invade the United States from Central America. They were mainly Honduran refugees uh, supported by the church and they were going through Mexico while we're there, many still in Tijuana, as the U.S. has sharply reduced allowing claims for asylum. For example, fleeing domestic or gang violence is no longer a, a reason for uh, asylum. So. Maybe, if, maybe we can show the hermanos. So one group we visit, I'm not going to many, one is called Hermanos in Camino. This is the famous, uh, this is La Bestia, the train, the beast that uh, hundreds of thousands of people have gone through Mexico. Hermanos in Camino, it's in Ixtepec, Oaxaca, and there's an amazing priest, Alejandro Sololinde, who has opened this center in, uh, in uh, Ixtepec, Oaxaca. And uh, basically they support and protect immigrants. Uh, we were there, it was very moving to me, maybe 100 people were there, uh, mainly from Honduras. There were also many other groups we visited. So I think the growth of immigrant justice movement in Mexico and the United States is really important. And I th my point here is to connect it to US foreign policy and neoliberalism. Larry Mosqueda just wrote a very good article on that. How can people find the article easier? It's in works in progress. Okay, so let me turn uh, now to key movements, mainly in Oaxaca and Chiapas, and conclude with the elections. Okay, so let me talk about a few movements. I have so many here, I'm not gonna go through all of them. I'll, I will print these notes on I'll, I'll send it to works in progress. So in terms of key movements, many of which we were part of in our class, but some of which you weren't. So there's a really growth of uh, a women's movement in Mexico. Uh, a friend of mine uh, who used to live in Olympia is saying it's probably the most significant movement in Mexico City, the feminist movement. Movements against violence uh, for reproductive rights. For example, abortions are only legal right now in Mexico City and the Zapatista communities. Uh, so there's really a kind of a movement for that and we'll see what happens to the elections. Uh, domestic violence, major, major in Mexico, maybe even more public than here. I'm not saying it's more than here, I don't know the numbers, but maybe more public, like in the streets. So uh, June 1st, we were, our class was in uh, San Cristobal, or near San Cristobal in Chiapas, and there was a march against feminicide. And here are a few photos uh, from the march. There was hundreds of people in many parts of Mexico. This is San Cristobal. I think there's more than... Okay, uh, okay. Uh, this is Noah, one of the people in the class, and uh, these, uh, this is the march too, and I guess, what was impressive to me, uh, which doesn't often happen here, was that uh, oppression of women and uh, liberation of women was very much linked to uh, class and gender in Oaxaca and Chiapas, uh, anti-racism, growth of women's consciousness. Also, uh, I was in Mexico City June 23rd after class left, and there was a LGBTI gay pride march, over 100,000 people in Mexico City. Really an incredible growth in the last few years. Okay, so that's one key movement. Thanks, Kelly. Okay, second movement, and this is the one we're probably most involved in, I, I want to stress, I would call it anti-extractivism. Okay, and I'll, I'll define extractivism in a minute. So as, a, as part of the Mexican and many other countries' development strategy, particularly under, increasing under outgoing President Enrique Peña Nieto, 
the idea of selling mine concessions to Mexican and especially foreign companies, first Canadian, then Chinese and, and US, often with these special economic zones that gave special rights to the companies there. Often the local communities, often these are in local and or indigenous communities, they're supposed to agree and they have rights to turn them down, but often lie to, there's often a way of causing divisions within the community, false promises about continued access to land, promise of, like we heard Trump talk about clean coal yesterday, talk about uh, clean, non-polluting mining companies, fair payments. So there's both a lot of resistance and a lot of repression. Uh, major resistance, but also major mining concessions in Chiapas, Guerrero, Puebla, Michoacan, other states too. And it was very inspiring, and I think we can all in here seeing, for example, occupations of the roads, where you had many generations resisting together. Some victories, but continual struggle. And these struggles against, again, what I call extractivism, uh, won't end with the presidency of uh, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador. So uh, let me give okay, a few brief examples. Uh, one really inspiring struggle to us was in, uh, in Chiapas, in a town called Acacoyagua, uh, near the border with Guatemala. So there's a group called Frente Popular in defense of El Sono Cusco, the Soconusco, Frente Popular in Defensa del Soconusco, F, uh, FPDS. They've basically, for almost two years, blocking the road with an occupation, again, multi-generational, multi you know, fearing, you know, risking their lives, many, many death threats, but building support throughout Mexico and movements against mining and extractivism throughout the Americas. Uh, what was impressive is a combination of popular education, learning about mining, learning about larger issues, uh, both uh, in Acacoyagua, but also beyond that, a lot of research done by a group called Otros Mundos, who we connected with an eco socialist group, uh, anti capitalist, led by Mexican women. Uh, they work with communities. Uh, mainly uh, indigenous in defense of water and territory. Territory. They do research, uh, food sovereignty, teaching in native languages like Tutsilan, Seltal. And again, by extractivism, I mean an economy built on taking, on taking out, rem removing, extracting resources from the earth and selling them on the world market. Uh, again, major resistance and uh, repression throughout the Americas to the strategy. Basically, they claim it's you know, clean industries, but it's dangerous jobs, really incredible pollution of the air and the water, expulsion of residents. Uh, so one of the high point of the trips was uh, visiting them. So, uh, so this is uh, photos of, uh, from the Frente Popular in Defense de Soconusco. We, we spent two days with them, eating with them, talking with them. Uh, and then, can you show the Otros Mundos? I have a few photos of them. Too. This is where we stayed outside of San Cristobal. This was, yeah, Libertad, a really amazing woman, one of the leaders of Otros Mundos, who's very involved in the struggle uh, in uh, Frente Popular. Okay, yeah, these are some of the popular education workshops they did about working with communities in native languages, about water, energy, uh, health, and so on. Uh, a second uh, group, and this is kind of a sad story, it's called Finca Alemania. So this is in uh, a place called Santa Maria Huatelco. It's on, near the coast in the uh, southern part of uh, Oaxaca, near the coast. 105 families, 105 families, uh, they took over a coffee plantation that was deserted about 15 years ago, and in 2013, they occupied, they built an autonomous community, their own schools, production of, of bricks and other construction materials, food, uh, the aim for like kind of autonomy and food sovereignty, where they would control their own food. And they're part of a group called CODEDI, C-O-D-E-D-I, Committee for Defense of Indigenous Rights. So we visited them in late, uh, 2018, really hospitable. Uh, they gave us a tour. 
they said there'd been some repression there, but they, uh, I think maybe didn't want to scare us, so they didn't say how much. But anyway, the leader of Alemania, the autonomous community in Kodeti, uh, who basically, who we seminared with and welcomed us and introduced us, Abraham Hernandez. Uh, he was kidnapped, tortured, and murdered in a nearby community in the medium of Kodeti on July 7th, about six weeks ago. Uh, yeah, and I got a message that afternoon saying to send a note to Penguinetta because they saw the truck that he was picked up was armed. People, people, probably paramilitary, may have been military. And but by the time I started to write, I got another note saying they'd found his body dead in the road a few miles from Alemania. Marty Isabel Morales, the other faculty member who uh, we did the class together, said uh, his killing really brought home to her the uh, reality of a trip to Mexico. So. According to Miguel Angel de los Santos, professor of law at the Autonomous University in uh, Chiapas and defender of political prisoners, repression, he said, in Mexico today, uh, even more than the 70s, is mainly in rural communities and against communities and their leaders fighting mining concessions, dams, logging, dispossession, especially indigenous rural communities. And this was confirmed by another really group, group we met called FRIBA, Center for Human Rights, Fray Bartolomé Los Casas, founded by Bishop San Luis, I mentioned. And they're active in working for collective human rights, saying that we often think of human rights as individual, but the idea of collective rights, rights of communities for self-determination. Uh, again, we visit many other struggles against extractivism. Okay. Uh, so in terms of movements, I'll, I want to mention two more, and then conclude with the elections. Okay. Also, in terms of movements of racial justice, again, this limited recognition, both the United States and Mexico, that there's a pretty significant uh, black or Afro-Mexican community. Over a million, uh, over a million uh, people who consider themselves African descent in Mexico, mainly in Oaxaca and Veracruz. And maybe can you show the photo? Yeah, this is uh, the one of the groups we visited. And here's a student in the class. Uh, so, uh, now, this is a dance that we, that we got invited to. So they're demanding recognition that they'd be counting the census. They're still not including the census, census and so on. I'm going to skip the labor movement now. It's a relatively weak movement now because of time. Uh, so let me tell about the Zapatista community and then conclude with the elections. Uh, okay, so. Briefly about the Zapatistas, I'll, I'll interchange just the EZLN uh, with them. In 1994, there was an armed uprising in Chiapas. They, they said it was, a, uh, it was a day that NAFTA went into effect and uh, over 100 people were killed. Since then, they've mainly been into armed self-defense, but not into uh, aggressive, uh, you know, trying to take over certain parts. Today, uh, they control five autonomous areas. They're small. We visited two, La Realidad y Morelia. Uh, again, poor communities in Chiapas, which is the poorest state in Mexico. The Zapatistas in 1996 demand for certain rights for indigenous people. It was in 19, uh, the government signed, but never, and never actually put into effect. They included control over natural resources, control over development, and autonomy. There's been major oppression against the Zapatistas. Uh, for example, in 1997, a group we met at individuals from uh, an octal group called Las Abejas or Bees, they had a similar program to the Zapatistas in terms of policy, but were unarmed. And a place called Octal, 45 of them were assassinated by people from the pre paramilitaries. So the military is near place we visit, but the threats today are mainly from paramilitaries. People may be hired by either the PRI, the government there, or by maybe rich landowners, and also by near, nearby communities. Uh, sad to say, there's been declining support for the Zapatistas since 1994, 2001, when they grew very rapidly. For example, they supported a candidate, Mara Chui, the head of the, the National Indigenous Congress, where the Easy Land played a major role, but she had limited support in indigenous communities outside of Chiapas. Also, Mexico, like I said, is an urban country, and the Easy Land program is primarily rural and indigenous. And moreover, the government has provided a lot of resources to nearby communities, undermining support for the Easy Land. 
Uh, and they've been so far, I would say, not successful, even though very positive, in developing a larger program and strategy. We, the class of uh, 26 and two teachers, we spent six days in two communities, Lada Elidad and Morelia. We met with the local government there, uh, and the government there, unlike most of Mexico, was seen very respected by the community, part of the community, seen as very honest. Women play a major role uh, in the Zapatista communities. There was acceptance, and again, what we saw of LGBT people. One of the people, for example, uh, a person who's trans, who uh, wore a skirt there and said he never would have won in other parts of Mexico and felt as accepted and more than they would in Olympia. There's been a major decline in violence against women, proud of indigenous uh, languages, they're teaching of indigenous languages. So I think, you know, some very, very positive things, but again, declining support. Uh, they get no government support. They have their own schools, health clinics, self-defense, armed, uh, you know, armed self-defense. But I think living in a global capitalist economy is what they call the problem, and their solution is autonomy. But again, it's autonomy meaning self-rule. But they're not economically autonomous. For example, a lot of companies sell coffee, but they have to use the low market prices of coffee. Many work outside the caracolas. They're local governments, communities, uh, foreign donations. They have really impressive health clinics, and we use some of them when we're sick. But for like major operations, people still have to go to the hospitals. Uh, the Zapatistas did not participate in elections. Uh, often they argue that the main position, the main uh, position was struggling between the Zapatistas and the Partidistas, the other parties that they saw all supportive of a corrupt and oppressive global capitalist system. So there was a feeling of freedom in these communities, uh, but also dangers outside. Okay, so we were invited to paint the mural in the community, and this is what our class uh, painted. Okay, so. Uh, okay, so let me conclude with the elections. I know I'm going a little over. So basically, Mexico, uh, you've had these all, the PAN, the PRI, the dominant parties, I would say very neoliberal parties, mass, mass corruption with corporations, uh, very much linked to the narco gangs, and even the PRD, the Revolutionary Democratic Party, which started as a left party in 88. Uh, they were both the governor and the mayorship uh, in Guerrero and Atsinapu, where the students disappeared in 2014. Uh, again, context, uh, in 1988, the Mexican election uh, was stolen by the PRI against Cuauhtémoc Cárdenas, the PRD candidate, who clearly won. And again, André Manuel López, over to AMLO, almost clearly won the election in 2006, but again, it was stolen in the huge protests. So together with stagnation in the economy, insecurity, uh, and the PRI, which had major organizations, communities, as well as mass organizations like union, peasant, uh, have really lost their legitimacy. AMLO left the PRD after 2012 election and formed the Movement for National Renovation, Morena, which became a political party in 2014, also very dependent on AMLO. Uh, so as already mentioned, there were elections in Mexico at all levels on July, 2000, July 1st, 2018, uh, almost seven weeks ago. There were three major parties uh, who led coalitions, one led by the PRI, the Revolutionary Institutional Party, second, the PAN, which was ruled from 2000 to 2012, and the third led by Morena with two other parties, uh, the Workers' Party and Encuentro Social, which was a coalition of very conservative, evangelical, family values parties. They call themselves the three together, Juntos Haremos Historia, together we make history. It was a very violent campaign, 150 politicians and 40 candidates from all political parties were murdered, including some in place that we had just visited uh, two weeks earlier. There was expectations of fraud because of past elections. Uh, many observers, I was one, we visited polling booths, I, I was in Oaxaca, support for AMLA would fear the election would be stolen, although Lopez Obrador was way ahead in the polls. The results, overwhelming victory, uh, there was a growth in turnout from the 2012 election. Since there had been more or less honest elections, in, open elections in Mexico, nobody ever gotten 50%. 
Uh, Morena and Amla got 53% for presidency. The PAN got 22%, and uh, the pre-Mead, the candidate, only got 16%. There was a large majority for Morena in the House of Deputies, and a smaller but significant majority in the Senate. So even with quite a bit of fraud at the local level, Morena won the majority of the governorships that were open, and the mayor of Mexico City, uh, Claudia Scheinbaum, who seems like a very progressive person. Uh, there was incredible jubilation and hope. For example, the polls closed at 6, and I remember that night going to Zocalo Center in, in uh, Mexico, in, in Oaxaca, which every city has, and there must have been 10,000 people. I couldn't even find uh, many people from our program I was supposed to, uh, to meet uh, there. So it was just really exciting. I've never seen so much excitement and hope. And it was, and it was similar in Mexico City where there were hundreds of thousands, over 100,000 people in the Zocalo too. What was significant also to me that the crowd was to the left of Lopez Obrador. that had a huge television, there was a movie screen in the middle. And when he, for example, said he was the president of all of Mexico, but particularly of the poor, People went wild, you know, like standing ovations. Uh, we talked about being mainly present of the poor. When he talked about uh, the needs of indigenous people, uh, there was a lot of cheering. We talked about LGBT, again, the rights of LGBT people and migrants. There was huge applause. But when we talked about working with all the parties and even with Trump, you couldn't hear a sound, and there were even a few boos. Uh, so, uh, anyway, I think the hope there in a country where there's so much cynicism to me is really, really positive. The new government will take power December 1st. So again, but the context is, you know, global capitalism, fear of capital flight, of Mexicans and foreign people uh, leaving the country, and Lopez Obrador ran a much less left campaign than he had in the past. For example, in the past he was against NAFTA, now he said he would modify it. So briefly, let me do the program and then conclude. Okay, so some of the program, which again, to me, is very limited, but I'll say anyway. He wants to increase pensions for all older people, uh, including people who are not covered by Social Security, who are in the informal labor market, increase scholarship, increase price for agricultural goods, increase government spending for health and education. He talks about a fourth transformation of Mexico, even though he's kind of vague what this transformation means. Uh, possibly legalize marijuana, and, and the Secretary of the Interior, which is the second most position, uh, she talked about legalizing op uh, opium too. Release people from prison for nonviolent drug crimes, also nonviolent people involved in the drug trade, like people who grow stuff. Put the army, which is involved in a major way in Mexico, uh, back in the barracks, both on the border and in the drug war. And again, but it's not to get rid of the, for example, the troops at the border in the south, uh, in Tapachula, in, uh, in Chiapas, but replace them by supposedly a modernized and more honest and better trained police. Uh, then pay for social programs, not by raising taxes, which he said he won't do, but by ending or reducing corruption, which is major, but it's not so clear how much he can do that. And I think he's a very, very honest person. Even people who didn't like him admitted he's very honest. Uh, continue contracts, most contracts with mines and energy companies. He said ones that were not corrupt, he would check all of them, ones that were not corrupt, where they weren't bribes, those would be continued. Uh, he's pro a regulated market and made clear he believes still mainly in private ownership of the means of production. He, he's uh, pushed for an independent foreign policy both before the election and afterwards, so against intervention uh, by Mexico in Venezuela and Nicaragua. Under Peña Nieto, been very involved in the campaign uh, to overthrow the Maduro government in Venezuela. Uh, with the uh, San Andres courts, the courts I mentioned, the major courts in 96 that never became law, uh, he did say he supported them and better treatment of migrants, even though the EZLN, the Zapatistas up till now said they, they do not support him and they didn't support him in the past. Uh, the cabinet, uh, it's very mixed because that I often look at who are the advisors. In terms of uh, economics, very mainstream economists, uh, some business people, the secretary of like interior of like the governor, a woman named Olga Sanchez Codero, uh, 
she seems very good to me, so it's a mixed cabinet. She was active in 68, and I struggled in 68. She was Supreme Court Justice with a lot of really good positions, uh, has supported, again, full rights to abortion, as does Lopez Obrador now, and uh, legalizing uh, many, many drugs. But again, he also has other people like the main advisor, a guy named Alfonso Romo, who was part of a very conservative Catholic organization, a major industrialist. Some of the national capitalists, people who produced mainly from Mexico, did support Lopez Obrador. So in conclusion, and let me conclude with this, I've gone over a little bit. Uh, I think you would say, uh, I recently you know, saw a note from uh, Noam Chomsky, and he said even though he'd met with Lopez Obrador twice, he's very centrist economically, and I think that's a fair description. Uh, I think I, I wanted to see more. I was trying to find more positive things, but because uh, he's often seen as this dangerous leftist, I think at best you might say he's somebody like Lula in Brazil. I think he's very honest, which I think is important and positive, but not sufficient. Uh, I don't see anything in this program, even this cabinet, that really transforming Mexico. Uh, I think there'll be much less repression, but still some of the worst laws, like an internal security of criminalizing dissent, he's talked about modifying them, but not ending him. So I guess the question is, well, let me say before the final question, I think there are likely to be very major conflicts with the US. I mean, that's even though it's a honeymoon right now, but I think around immigration, if there's some legalization of drugs there, more restrictions on US corporations, I see major conflict between the US and Mexico. And I think Trump is so hated in Mexico, I think that helped Lopez over the win because he was seen as the one most likely to stand up to him. He's written like books criticizing Trump, but we'll see what happens there. But I do, I do predict major conflict. So to me, there's a lot of hope. And my final words here is what happens with this hope that so many people have of been so much pessimism, cynicism, skepticism in Mexico. If it's just thinking, let's wait for Moreno and Lopez Obrador as president to solve our problems, they're not going to happen. To me, the hope is that this hope gets uh, connected more to organizing. I said it'll be less repression to organizing to the left of Morena and AMLO. I think they're progressive, maybe social democratic or maybe liberal neoliberalism, you know, neoliberalism of the human face, but still very limited. But my hope is, you know, the Zapatistas, other autonomous communities, maybe like Chiron, which we'll hear about in a second, uh, the a growing labor movement, the growing women's movement I mentioned, community organization will form something that really pushes for a just and equal and uh, socialist uh, Mexico. Thank you very much. Uh, I, it'd be nice to talk about how the Zapatistas took over, how the common people took over control. Okay. I don't think they have control on Chiapas. You mean in the Zapatista communities? Well, yes, it's a very, very small part of Chiapas, but I think it was a really inspiring struggle where they organized for many years. And the uprising I mentioned, January of 94, was a combination of local people, mainly indigenous, and kind of a guerrilla movements that had originally come from northern Mexico, went there in the early 1980s and organized for many years. I think both sides learned from each other, and that led to the uprising in 1994, and they have maintained these autonomous communities now for over 20 years. So I think my point here, it's really impressive, really inspiring, but it's also very limited. So when you talked about the, the extractivist economy you okay. know, continuing forward, and I don't know, is there fracking? Yes. Or is it just not going to happen? Or like, what's, what's with the fracking? Because I was like, I was very excited when I saw it. So he did talk about uh, challenging some what I called extractivism, but then since the election, he has said he is very much in the long run against these foreign mining companies, and he's not going to end contracts, but not new ones. But what was not said was what about Mexican companies like Grupo Mexico, which used to own, you know, the, in Ruston, the Sarco plant. Well, they're just as bad as the foreign companies. So, again, if you look at his cabinet, like the Secretary of Environment is somebody who's been very much against fracking and so on. So again, I think it depends what happened. Uh, it, like I said, I think the really major movement in Mexico, I just mentioned the mining. There's also, we visited incredible 
uh, powerful in uh, Huchitan against these wind farms, Parque Helicos. The people think wind farms are good, but what they were doing was basically uh, destroying the land. People were not allowed to come back there. Incredible issues of the animals dying, but also health issues in terms of hearing, skin of people there. So the, almost all of these groups that are working around the mining stuff, I would say there was a, and I said the, the, also against dams is another major issue, logging. I would say from the people we met, uh, there was a split between people who supported M Lopez Obrador people who were, thought he was the least bad in Morena, and people who said they were not going to vote. Uh, but I think in the end, most people did vote for him, but with a, with a kind of worry, like on the things you just said, that uh, he might backtrack on that. He did mention it, but he didn't say completely he would, he would end it. Okay, let me turn it over. Buenas, buenas noches a todos, hermanas y hermanos. Es un gusto estar aquí con ustedes. He's saying, uh, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. He hopes to share a lot about his people, his town, his culture. Bueno, en la Chiran is in the indigenous Purepecha community of Michoacan. He is also saying that when the Spaniards came to conquer Mexico, that the Purepecha had a very strong resistance. They resisted the, Span the Spaniards, and they also resisted the Aztec Empire as well. Uh, they did not uh, surrender. Uh, proof of uh, the fact that the Pura Pecha survived and are alive and well is that he's here right now, that we've expanded. We're not just in Michoacan anymore. We're here in Olympia. Uh, our ancestors um, all over Latin America rebelled. Some rebelled against the English, some against the French, some against the Portuguese. The important theme here is that there was a colonizing invader force. And he is saying that uh, he wants to detail that history right now. Bueno, cuando llegaron los europeos, nuestros antepasados no entendían la estructura de pensamiento. Nosotros, eh, los teóricos, llaman la cosmovisión. Lo... Cosmovisión is the word he used. And he was saying that when the Europeans came, that uh, the Pura Pecha didn't really understand the way that their, uh, their ideologies was. They didn't really understand their language. But now, 500 years later, there's been a switch. Um, people, a lot of many Pura Pecha, understand the languages of the colonizers, and they understand their own language, too. They're reclaiming their identity. It comes from generations of people who've defended uh, the region Pura Pecha. The Spaniards uh, fought against his ancestors, and they were unsuccessful, and so he feels like it's in his blood to defend Chiran. Uh, he's saying even here there's evidence of capitalist destruction of nature. We see burning forests. Uh, these burning forests are constitu constitute of dead plants and dead animals. You see there's an unhealthy release of carbon monoxide in the air. This is created by humans. So this is where the cosmovision of Chiran comes in to counter this narrative. Y bueno, eh, nos Chiran ha Saying that the Pura Pecha and Chiran people participated in different struggles in Mexico for the past two centuries. In 2011, the rise of the self-defense group for the community of Chiran against organized crime marked a new beginning. April 15, 2011, in the early hours that uh, the people of Chiran territory, they demanded justice. Uh, they demanded uh, self-governance over the territory. Uh, they wanted to protect it from injustice and organized crime, and this should not be seen as illogical. So in the, talk in the documentary, it talks about how the people of Chiran had to take justice into their own hands. They had to defend the community themselves, and uh, part of the movement after April 15th const constitute around general assemblies. Uh, general assemblies, the sharing of power, is a common thread among many different native groups. In Chiran, which is in the state of Michoacan, that they say they wanted um, a more municipal government, uh, self-governed rule, a popular assembly to decide things, uh, community rulings, 
and that they didn't want to allow the results of the popular elections to dictate their life because they didn't see validity in electoral politics of Mexico. That in Chiran there was a lot of uncertainty after every election in July. People feel uncertainty with a political system that they feel doesn't even belong to them, a foreign brought system that they don't really recognize or appreciate. In Chiran, they, uh, many people spoke with the elders, they listened to what the elders said around the campfires, and they decided to fight um, a multi-generational approach against the PRI to reject electoral politics from the past, uh, grandfathers and grandchildren, friends, parents, sons, many generations of people fighting against electoral politics. Y preguntamos, ¿y entonces qué vamos a hacer? So when the people of Chiran decided what kind of government they wanted to have, they listened to the elders again, and the elders said, um, we have to go back to a type of governance that we had in the past. Um, so some of the younger generations started uh, studying ancient documents, again trying to retrieve ancient memories from the elders, in order, and going to the past in order to build a future. Um, so they made a formal proposal to the Michoacan government about having an internal normative system. Uh, it'd be the new form of government and rejecting what the state of Michoacan had presented them before. At first sight, um, the Michoacan government was denying their rights, uh, not really giving them the respect they needed. The elders told the younger generation uh, to fight against white people, which was something that the younger generation wasn't really accustomed to. They figured, why would uh, white people or the formal government care about what we want? But the older generation insisted that they fight for their customs. So the elders told them to go convince them, and to Samuel and some of the people with them, it seemed like a very difficult goal. Uh, they spoke to five ministers, three uh, voted in favor, two voted against. So um, there is a, the demand was to have an assembly in the four Chiran Barrios. Uh, one assembly would be dedicated information uh, that's the first point. The second point would be the return to the constitution of usos and costumbres. Usos and costumbres, the New Mexican constitution of limited autonomy for indigenous communities. He's saying there's a document from the federal government uh, overriding the state um, to try and understand better how the Chiran assembled themselves. They said they don't know how they run their assemblies, they don't understand the usos and costumbres. That on February 5th, 2012, they made an official vote in the plaza of the community to return to the three-point system and specifically the usos and costumbres being the focal point of that system. So take in mind that initial uprising took place on April 15th, 2011, and by February 5th, 2012, the Chiran region had organized a more formal government that it's a lot of progress for such a short span of time to develop a new system of governance. There's not a president, there's not an executive and legislative branch, uh, there's an alternative model, there's a, there's a municipal president but who has to collaborate with people from around the community. So that there's essentially uh, was a system of seven different councils, but now it's expanded to nine. Some of those are the Elder Council, the Council of Justice, the Council of Neighborhoods, the Civil Council, the Local Council, and one of the most recently implemented was the Women's Council. So uh, the Chiran is no longer uh, working behind a model of traditional political parties. Uh, they decide he'll be on councils based on uh, values and ways that people honor Puta Pecha history, honoring families integral to that. Um, in the assembly, sometimes authority is given to people without the people having to do a campaign, which you really don't need if you're an honorable person. He's pretty sure it's called direct democracy or something like that. It's something that's been present in Puta Pecha history for a long time. It's not something that they had to go somewhere else and steal and then bring back. So he feels like a uh, there was a lot of planning that went into it even before the popular uprising that maybe there's 30 years of hard research of people reclaiming Pudapechan identity. Um, 
and the primary objective is to reorganize Puta Pecha society, identity, and culture. The primary objective was not tons and tons of construction. Uh, in the opinions of the new Puta Pechan rule and old Puta Pechan ancestors' customs, that um, large construction projects are not uh, conducive to supporting the environment and supporting the rainforest. Y algo que me parece importante. He thinks in four years of the new government system, which is the Sistema Normativa Interno, the internal normative system, that they made more progress and empowered people more in four years than electoral politics had in the last 20. Therefore, definitive proof that the European models of power that came by force uh, were ineffective and did not work well. Uh, he says that native people um, should be ruling over themselves, that when members of community are directly participating in democracy and governments, that they know more the, de the fine details of what is lacking, of what needs reinforcement, what needs support in the community. In Sharan, there's been the start of community-owned businesses, collectively-owned businesses. There's no need for uh, foreign companies. Uh, there's no need for supermarkets. Uh, that in this model of collectively owned businesses and locally owned businesses of people of Chiran, that they have a big plaza and people can grow what they need to survive and they can sell a lot of their crops to neighboring communities who can come and sell what they need as well. What he's found here in the United States is that the majority of food seems to be unorganic and doesn't seem to have much flavor. Uh, that we consume so many chemicals, so many pesticides, so many fertilizers that uh, it seems as if many people are actually killing themselves. That there's writers, actors, directors from many different parts of the world, including the United States, because it is an international film festival. In Hollywood, uh, you see actors, they shoot their movies, and then around the community they have bodyguards everywhere they go. They don't really normalize themselves with the rest of the population. However, in Chiran, you see actors, and there's no security. They, become, they immerse themselves in the community, and he thinks that adds a much more human element to actors. He's saying that uh, they found a way to empower young people's artistic sensibilities as well, that instead of turning their back on graffiti, that in Chadan, that graffiti has been embraced. Uh, young people feel very empowered to contribute their art to the region. Uh, in the church, there's actually street art, which is very rare. Uh, what was in the past seen as vandalism is now celebrated for the art that it is. It's had an effect on young people as far as more young people are participating in the local, local form of government.